The core idea of the house is about connecting with place and the house is conceived as a sort of a, a tent uh, by which you'd live in there and you would have connections to the outside environment. And it's conceived of a couple of different elements. The first being a floor plane that um, acts as a big veranda and the idea was that we would live on a veranda in this garden. The other element is a uh, series of concrete pipes which run through the house and through the garden itself and they blur the edges of the building. The third element is a tent-like roof structure that sits over the top of these things and it has a really lightweight informal feel so that it has a little bit of a lack of permanence. So it's more about living in the garden um, than it is in a building. We weren't looking to build. We weren't looking for a block at that time. Uh, Andrew and I just liked to go on walks around the city and we had never actually been on this part of the river before. And we actually ended up parking just at the front of the block and we saw the sign and we thought, oh, well, let's just go have a sticky beak. It's not like we could ever afford it. This is Mount Lolly. We checked it out and we just loved it. It reminded us a little bit of Oregon where we met, um, which is in the US. It's heavily treed, a lot of green, and that's not something that you get a lot of in WA, especially in inner city Perth. We were at that point that we were thinking, okay, we need to decide, are we gonna go back to Oregon or are we gonna make a life here? So when we went to Oregon, we actually realized that it had changed a lot from what we had remembered. And we realized that actually we were really liking our our life in Perth. So we came back and really started looking at, okay, well, let's embed ourselves in Perth then. We looked at the block, it hadn't sold, and that's when we really started looking at making an offer and what we could do and what Andrew could possibly design on the property. And we put in an offer and it was accepted and all of a sudden this is ours and we needed to start building. I had once been told by a mentor that it was a prerogative of an architect to buy a difficult site and in Perth there really aren't any because they're all flat and sandy and this one had a fall of eight metres um, from the front boundary to the rear. It had water logging problems, it was a rear lot so it had access problems and it, it presented a challenge that um, was unusual for Perth. So we went around originally about trying to find the driest points on the property um, and identifying where those springs were. And then we dealt with all the drainage um, by collecting it and then reusing it through the garden as irrigation. And we tried to use the simplest forms available to cut down on cost and efficiency of building. So the building is essentially a square with a pyramid roof. And that, what that does is it shrinks the perimeter um, facade, which is the most sort of expensive and has the most heat loss or heat gain, but then lift the center so that we have a large volume so that it feels spacious. There's lots of materials that flow through the glass lines and the edge of the building is deliberately sort of staggered or blurred so that we always feel like we're part of the garden. When we got the block, I guess I very consciously understood this was probably the one opportunity for Andrew to build without a client as much as possible. That being said, I had to live in it. So I tried to basically give him a set of non-negotiables, things that I needed from a house. And then I tried to give him as much creative freedom after those non-negotiables as possible. And so one of my requirements was it needed to have a lot of natural light so that I could grow indoor plants. I wanted the, there to be a bit of a blurring between inside and out. I wanted to interact with the outdoors as much as possible. I don't know how he envisioned this plant chandelier, but he showed me the design and I just thought, perfect, there are my indoor plants, there's my natural light and, um, and the tubes as well, I mean. I had never really envisioned uh, the natural plants in our new house to be in this form, but I mean, that's, that's why he's the architect, he's creative, because I think it's way better than what I would have designed into a house. <laughs> so the house is meant to be opened up and as if you're living outside all the time. So we have the large, um, big bifold doors, we have doors on every sort of facade, and we have the ventilation on the roof itself. And that all works as a passive system. 
and we were able to get five degrees difference over the uh, air column between the ground floor and the, and the roof apex and that draws air up through the structure and ventilates it out the top. We have an infrared heating system, so the ceiling is aluminium and is reflective of infrared and so is the glass and we have this central wood fire or wood heater and all the infrared is kind of bounced off of those reflective surfaces and because we don't have walls we're able to bounce the heat over the top so in the bedroom you get um, infrared reflection and you get heat from the fireplace even though you can't see it. I guess with such a small house, um, I was worried about us constantly getting in each other's way. We'd lived in small rentals before that, you know, I would be straightening my hair and he would need to shower and that those things contradict each other. And that's where this idea of a vanity came to light. Um, everyone thinks I'm responsible for that mirror in there. That was actually Andrew. <laughs> Um, I knew we needed a big mirror of some description if you're going to put it in your hallway. But um, he actually emailed me saying, I found a mirror for you. And yeah, the vanity, <laughs> it's a bit more over the top than I, than I thought it would, but, but I love it. I think our outdoor toilet really challenges people. I didn't know it at first in the design, but what Andrew's done is forced you to interact with the outside. Um, in those brief moments. It's covered, your walk to the toilet. It's this very small, short interaction with the outside. I was actually doing research when I was the curator at Subiaco Museum, and Daglish was a, a suburb of Subiaco getting developed, and it was considered a very modern suburb. Those designs started integrating toilets inside. That was kind of the first time you're starting to see that, and I came across an amazing letter to the editor um, from someone saying, how on earth do we think this is okay to bring your toilet inside? That's unsanitary, it's gross. And I remember sending it to Andrew being like, yes, <laughs> this person thinks the way that we think, but it was, it was a letter to the editor from 1920s. So the house isn't really about architecture for architecture's sake. It's about connecting the people who live in it with the environment that um, surrounds them. And that enriches people's lives because we live in a wonderful place um, called Western Australia.